if you watched my video for number two, you heard me talk about the chronology rule and how we can distinguish whole passage questions that are about everything versus no line reference questions which are much more narrow. There's a specific place where they tell us the answer even though the question itself doesn't really tell us where to look. And so number three is another one of these no line reference questions. And I know this because again, it's not asking for something general. It's asking for something very specific, a technique the narrator uses to represent Silas's character before he adopted Epi. It's, it's very narrow. So that's a clue that there's probably a narrow set of lines that kind of hint at this answer. And we can once again use the chronology rule to help us here, right? The next question tells us to look at line seven, so we should think that this answer is gonna be before line seven. So if we do this, look, we can go here, line seven is right here. So this is where the answer to number four is, so we should expect number three to be up here. And we read this for question two, but let's read it again. Unlike the gold, which needed nothing and must be worshipped in closed locked solitude, which was hidden away from the daylight, was deaf to the song of birds and started no human, to no human tones, Epi was a creature of endless claims and ever-growing desires, seeking and loving sunshine and living sounds and living movements, making trial of everything with trust and new joy and stirring the human kindness in all eyes that looked on her. Okay, so... Does this really answer the question, a, a, uh, Silas's character before he adopted Epi? Well, there's some things, right? We talk about the gold is, needs nothing, it's in solitude, hidden away, uh, deaf to the song of birds, whereas Epi is contrasted with that, right? Um, desires, sunshine, love, living sounds, living movements, um, joy, uh, kindness, um, right? There's a contrast. Now look, I don't feel sufficient that I've, you know, have that sufficient information to answer this question, but this is the thing with the chronology rules. It tells us where we should start reading, but if we don't find that they have the answer, we can always read more, right? So this is why the no reading strategy works. If you, we don't read from the start because we don't want to waste our time on unnecessary stuff, and we can use the chronology rule to figure out small places to read when we don't have a line reference. But if it's not enough, we, we are not prevented from reading more. We always can. And look, at the very next line, it says, the gold had kept his thoughts. Now we're, we're talking more about the gold and maybe what Silas did before. It had kept his thoughts in an ever-repeated circle. Ever-repeated circle, leading to nothing beyond itself. Leading to nothing. Epi was an object compacted of changes and hopes that forced his thoughts onward and carried them far away from their old eager pacing toward the same blank limit, carried them away to the new things that would come with the coming years, when Epi would have learned to understand how her father Silas cared for her and made him look for images of that time and the ties and charities that bound together the families of his neighbors. Okay, some of the end part I don't understand, but look at the pink. There's yet another kind of contrast, right? The yellow and the pink are doing a lot of repetition and it's telling me the difference, right? So again, the, the, the past is bad. The, the future, the, the present with Epi is good. Ever repeated circle leading to nothing. It sounds pretty grim, right? Hopes, dreams, carried them away. Coming years, new things. That's a, that's a clear contrast, repeated. So we can use that. Let's look at uh, the choices now. The narrator emphasizes Silas's former obsession with wealth by depicting his gold as requiring certain behaviors on his part. So that's, ooh, I don't love that choice. Um, there are some things I like about it, I guess. The narrator emphasizes Silas's former obsession with wealth. Well, notice what we highlighted originally. The gold is kind of locked away, hidden away, and he's, it's being worshiped. So that does fit with what I'm, what I'm reading. Um, the certain behaviors, I, I don't really know. Um, I don't know what those behaviors would be. That's strange to me. Um, I don't know. B, the narrator underscores Silas's former greed by describing his gold as seeming to reproduce on its own. Well, reproduce on its own, that's really specific. The gold reproduces, it's hidden away, it needs nothing. That doesn't mean that it reproduces on its own. It's not, it's gold. It's not like a living thing. Um, his thoughts are on an ever-repeating circle. Again, that's, the, that's his thoughts, not the gold. This statement is very weird. How would the gold reproduce on its own? It like doesn't even just make any sense. So I don't know why I would pick that. Maybe, 
you're just misreading the question. I don't really know, but this is just like a nonsense choice to me. Like, I don't, I don't know what they even mean by the gold reproducing on its own. And the fact that I'm confused by that is not a great sign. That probably means it's nonsensical. C, the narrator hints at Silas's former antisocial attitude by contrasting his present behavior toward his neighbors with his past behavior towards them. Well, I kind of agree that we're talking about his past behavior and his present behavior, right? So the past, he's like this, it's all bad. The present, now with Epi, seems to be good. But again, we're, we're talking about Epi, his neighbors. That's a phrase that's not mentioned here. I read a lot. But I didn't read anything about neighbors. I read about Epi, I read about Silas, I read about Gold. Nothing about neighbors. D, the narrator demonstrates Silas's former lack of self-awareness by implying that he is unable to recall life before Epi. Well, no, it, it doesn't say he's unable to recall it. I mean, it's contrasting his life before her and his life since her. But it doesn't say that he doesn't remember the former life. I mean, the fact that it even talks about it seems to suggest that he, he is aware of the change. So this is a very strong phrase. And I think that this kind of applies to all of these choices, to be honest, is we have choices where there's something really noticeably bad. Whereas A, what ends up being the answer that I pick, I don't like it. But the bad phrase is very weak. And the reason I didn't like it is I didn't know what it was. I didn't know it was so vague that I didn't really, I didn't really have any problems with it, but I also didn't really have anything that I liked about it either. And so it's, that's the difference is a lot of times we end up using kind of process of elimination by eliminating choices that we know are really, really bad and then settling for a choice that just kind of is fine. That's what's happening here. And now, in hindsight, I might be able to justify this. Like, okay, his gold requires, it required certain behaviors. So I guess it required to be worshipped. Um, it required him, it had kept his thoughts, right? So here, maybe this part, right? The behavior is the way his thoughts worked. I really don't know. Um, but I know the other three choices are wrong. This happens a lot to me. I'm very good at the reading section, but even still, I think, you know, there are definitely times where I end up picking answers where I'm just like, okay, this is the best I can do. The other ones I know are bad, so I have to settle for this other thing. You have to get used to that feeling. It doesn't feel great, but it's part of the SAT, so you have to get used to it. It will happen. And here's a case, too, where, like, I'm kind of violating the chronology rule a little bit. I mean, I'm going a little bit beyond where question four would have had me look, but honestly, I would not count this as a breaking of the chronology rule because I'm kind of like in that same zone, right? Like it's kind of like a longer sentence and I'm kind of just continuing on the sentence. And so it's not really getting too far beyond where the chronology of the passage would tell me. It's all kind of looking at the same zone of lines. And so to me, this, this also makes sense that I'm kind of finding the answer in the area where I would expect. I can kind of make a behavior pop out of these lines. I cannot make the neighbors pop out. I cannot make um, amnesia pop out. I cannot make self-reproducing gold pop out. Those things I know are not there. So I settle for some weak answer that kind of just gets by. It's a hard question. I hope this helped. I hope this at least gave you a sense of what it feels like sometimes to pick answers that we don't love and the reasons we pick those answers. We still have a reason for picking it. That's the key. It's not just a gut feeling. I have reasons that I've worked out on the other choices and that lets me feel a little bit more confident picking something that I don't love.